Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10, 27, your fellow redeemed. You might hear this from time to time, if, if you're married, maybe from your spouse, maybe from a friend, and you kind of hope to hear it in jest. You, you maybe disapprove of something they're doing, and to defend themselves, they apply the old, where's the love statement to you? If you love me, you would be happy with what I'm doing. And if that's done in jest, then I guess it's kind of funny, and you can kind of move on. However, if it's seriously done, and that love is missing towards that individual, then we have a completely different situation. Now, when we talk about love here, love can be very complex. So let's think of love in a passionate sense, but not necessarily in an overly emotional sense. Let's think of love in a deep desire, okay? A deep desire to care and a deep concern for someone else, and you want to express that to that person, even if it means a loss for you, even if it means you're going to open yourself up to them. Think of it in that sense. In the marriage relationship then, marriage oftentimes can hover between love and duty, love and duty. And at at times, a person is moved by love to express their appreciation of the other, to express their willingness to put that other person First and to see to their needs. And when that is kind of love-driven, in, in many ways it's, it's sort of effortlessly. It's, it's easy to do. You do it and you don't even realize you're doing it. Everything flows in a wonderful, joyful way. However, if marriage was just pure love in that sense, then you, you're probably going to be kind of annoying to be around because you're going to stare at each other and play, let me count the ways I love you sort of thing. So marriage also needs this other side of it, and it's kind of called the duty side, and that's sort of the commitment, the, the honor, the, the I'm going to get this done, sort of the non-thrilling things of life, but need to be done. We have to do those. And those two things sort of make up marriage, and most of us kind of hover between the two, with sometimes one being a little bit more than the other. However, if, if, if one is missing, Say the marriage is just all love and no duty, then again, you're, you're probably an annoying couple. And so, you know, people are going to run from you when they invite you over. And the other thing is, you probably, when you run into the responsibilities of marriage and the responsibilities of life, they can almost seem overwhelming. It's just so difficult to do. Yet at the same time, if one's marriage is just total duty, and the passion or the love flame, let's say, is kind of out, then marriage can become a joyless chore for the spouses. It's just a matter of functioning together. Probably how Vulcan marriages are in the Star Trek world. Most healthy relationships and marriage hover between the two of of love and duty working along with each other, with love probably being a little bit more of the driving force. Now, what does this have to do with the sermon text you're thinking? Actually, quite a bit. Quite a bit. The sermon text here, John is given these words by Jesus to express them to the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus. We, of course, we benefit from this as well, as we benefit from any word of God. First and foremost, God gives us his word. What he's seen to give us is good for us, necessary and vital. Second of all, though, in this particular letter, along with the other six, there's various situations and conditions that these Christians and these congregations were involved in, and these situations aren't just for them. They could also be very similar to any Christian church at any time. And so we look at them, and we can look at these conditions and examine ourselves as individuals and as a congregation, perhaps what they're struggling with, we're struggling with. Perhaps with what they were doing, which was good and right, maybe we're, by the grace of God, doing that's good and right, and we need more encouragement in that. Either way, they speak to us. They're good for us. Over the next several weeks, we're going to consider then these seven letters to the seven churches. In your back of your bulletin, there's sort of an order that the letters follow. The letters basically follow this rough outline. There's always a command to write. There's a description of the speaker that's taken from the first chapter of Revelation. Then the third part, there's a word of commendation. Then there's a word of criticism, a word of admonition. Then there's a call for the people to hear. 
and they conclude with a word of promise. More or less, all seven of the letters follow that. So here John is writing to a congregation, and he's speaking to this congregation, and, and you sort of have a theme when you read over those verses, and the theme is, where's the love? Where is the love that you had at one point in time? Where's the love for the Savior that burned so bright in you and made up so much of who you are? Where'd that go? Where'd it go? What happened? This is a great question, especially for all Christians, to create healthy examination. We look at ourselves and we can say, where is my love for the Savior? Is it burning as bright as it once did in my life? Is there a period in my life where the passion to follow Jesus and almost an effortless joy to do what the Lord said and share him, is it there or is it starting to get swallowed up in the business of everyday living? Do I look at Jesus and go, whew, so glad I got Jesus, now I'm not in trouble, so I better do what he says because he saved me? Or is it more of, yes, Jesus is my savior, I, I'm so appreciative of that, I, I want to follow him. I want to do what he says. I know what's right. I know what's good. This morning then, in these kind of considerations, let's take a look at what John writes to the church, chapter 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you also... This is in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever's an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So far, the very words of our God, mindful that these words are holy, that they are perfect, that they come from a divine origin. We want to remind ourselves of that. That they're not just written for that specific church, but they were written for us as well. God intends them to be used for our own personal growth and application. That end we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So God announces this, and this is just an incredible announcement. This truth is shared, and it's an exciting truth. It kind of should make the hairs on the, the back of your neck stand up when you hear this. God says this. First one, he says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven lampstands in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. What God is saying is what we want to hear. God is telling this people, I'm with you. I am with you. The all-powerful, loving God is not just with you. He's for you. Your cause your life, your purpose, your goal, that is, is God's. He dwells among you. He cares about us. This is something that so easily slips a person's minds from time to time. We so easily walk away and think sometimes, that I'm just, it's just me going at whatever obstacles in front of my life. And we ignore this fact that, no, it's not us. It's God. God is with us. We're not alone. We're not abandoned. We're not forsaken. Sometimes we just need to pause And thank God for his presence. It is real. It is wonderful. It is a comfort that God has chosen us. God has chosen you to be with you. Just like he did with those in the church in Ephesus. Now John moves on in the second verse. And this is the word of commendation. He says, I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. You have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. This commendation is incredibly impressive. Like, who doesn't want to hear this? If you hear this from God, you want to frame it, put it on your wall, and basically stare at it every day. The Lord first is saying, I know your hard work. Wow. The Lord is saying, I know you work hard for me. I mean, we all like hard workers. We all want to be hard workers, I hope. The Lord is saying to them, you diligently 
work hard, you labor in my kingdom service, you share the gospel, you uplift each other, you encourage each other, you look out for each other. This is hard to do, especially in a world that doesn't want us to follow God. Yet Jesus says, I know your hard work. I know you're doing it. This course brings up a natural question for us as a congregation, but as individuals. You hear this and you're faced with this question, am I a hard worker for the gospel? Would the Lord write to me and say, I know you, and I want to commend you for your hard work, your hard work for the gospel's sake. Do I look for opportunities? Do I look at the opportunities that God creates for me to further his kingdom and share his message? One of our big problems is we live in the age of what will probably become known as the age of entitlement. We could put a slash on there. We live in the age of entitlement slash laziness. We live in a culture that seems to be driven by distractions and selfish pursuits. So when I wonder, would the Lord speak to me and say, I know your hard work? Would the Lord say, well, I know your hard work after you did this, this, and this, and then found time to serve me? Would the Lord say, yeah, I know your hard work. When it was convenient for you, then you you stretched yourself out and looked to further my kingdom verse like this puts us in a position for good, healthy introspection on, on questions like this, and that's always beneficial. Let's move on to the second point. He says in the church of Ephesus, he commends them for their perseverance, and, and we can understand this this way. He commended them because they were patient, that they stuck to trusting God. They stuck to following God's word. Even in the midst of difficulties, he would say that you endured a lot of hardships, but you didn't grow weary. You persevered. Paul wrote to the the church in Rome, he wrote to him talking about have patience in affliction, be faithful in prayer, Romans 12, 12. It's just easy to get lost. It's easy to get off the path God would have us on when things are difficult, when we're in moments of heightened stress. Our nature wants to carry us away, to, to persevere and to be steadfast. That's something else. That's something wonderful. It's a gift the Spirit gives. He commends them for another thing, third thing here. He says that he commends them. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. You found them false. The Lord is saying to them, you know something. You know that doctrine is important. The Lord is telling them, you know that sound teaching matters. That you found individuals who were either among you or came to you and they said things I didn't say. We called that false teaching. And you said, go. You're not going to be part of us. You're not going to stay with us. He's saying to them, you realize that being part of a congregation, a church fellowship, is built around true teaching. And this is a good thing. This is a healthy thing. And naturally, this isn't the current trend of our Christian culture. Our Christian culture will stress something like a program. That's why you belong to a church or social services or age group or comfort or the social scene, personality of the minister or staff. These are the kind of things that determine why people belong to congregations. Not so in Ephesus. And God commended them for this. He said, in Ephesus, you are well-defined and well-defended in what you believe. You know the word. You're people of the words. You know the Bible. You know what's taught in the Bible. Therefore, you know what's taught in the congregation. This is a good thing. This is a great thing. Naturally, we pray that that's the situation with us, too, at St. Matthew. That we're people of the word. that, That we're faithful in our studies of God's word. That we could recognize false teaching when it comes to us and therefore push it away. That we're not swayed by the latest religious fashion and fads that are out there, and there are many. There's another point here that that often confuses people, but it's a word of condemnation. The the Lord says to the church in Ephesus, he says, I commend you because you didn't tolerate the Nicolaitans. The natural question is, who and what were the Nicolaitans, and what were they doing and saying? Well, it appears that the Nicolaitans were the kind of individuals that did some things not so good. They turned the liberty that they have in Jesus into a license to sin. They took things like forgiveness and they used it as an opportunity for just plain immoral living. They compromised between the truths of God and pagan rituals that were going on at the time and acted like God approved. Basically, if we want to look at it in the light of today, the Nicolaitans would be those who embrace alternative lifestyles and say that God is all for that. They'd be those that say living together outside of wedlock is just as good as marriage and God is okay with that. They would say promiscuity isn't a problem, it's just an expression of people. I think you get the idea. 
The Nicolaitans seem to purport that kind of thinking, and Jesus says, I hate that. I hate that practice, and you hated it, and that's a good thing. So this is sounding great. You know, end of letter, Church of Ephesus, a model for us all. Well, as far as that stuff goes, yes, it is. However, the Lord had more to say. Here comes the yet, or sometimes translated the but. Here's what the Lord says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you first have. Verse 5, consider how far you have fallen, repent, and do the things that you did at first. See, here comes the yet to the but. Jesus is saying, this loyalty without love for me, it takes its toll, and it's very dangerous. You can think of, again, the marriage relationship where the flame of passion is just gone and it's only duty now that that functions. The question that sometimes is asked by people is this, well, how did this lack of love show itself? How did they show that they didn't have this love? Some wonder, was it kind of a legalistic church? Did the people become very cynical about the world and, and unbelievers around them? Did their worship become very stereotyped in that it was all form and and no fervor, no passion behind it? Did the church start operating like a business and and not like a family and that concern for people was just thrown out the window when there was a goal that had to be accomplished by the people? Did the people of the church get to this point where they didn't want to empathize with others in the congregation? They stopped walking in, in the mile of a man's shoe sort of thing. Did they just turn following God into a duty and therefore a drudgery, and therefore this attitude of, I have correct teaching, and you don't, so forget about you, I don't care about you. Was that what ruled the church? Did they think that you can have either correct teaching or you can be the big lovey church, but you can't be both? Is that what went on in Ephesus? You know, honestly, we don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us that. What the scripture says is that when the love is gone, when the flame no longer burns, that's a bad thing. The words of the text, repent. Then a little bit later, if you do not repent, I will come among you and I will remove your your lampstand from its place. So this is something when the Lord speaks, we want to take to heart, especially in the area of self-examination as congregation and as individuals. We want to look at this and say, well, where's my love? We want to pause for a minute and, and ponder, has my love for the Savior been swallowed up in the business of everyday living? Did I have a flame for the Lord that burned really brightly at times, but now it's just starting to shrink under the weight of the sinful world and all the trials that I have to endure? I had this passion for Jesus when I first realized he brought me out of death and into life, but now the passion is kind of moving away. I'm getting distracted. I have other things to do. Healthy introspection. One Christian author says, if we want to really give ourselves a a love test, And that is our passion for the Savior burning. He offers three areas of examination. One, he says, first, ask this of yourself. Has your joy for your Savior been lost? Or have you lost a little bit of joy that you once took in Jesus? And basically what that means, are you bored in church? Do you come to worship? Do you approach your Bible readings and you're just like, I already know this. God loves me. Amen. Go on with life. Is that kind of cynical boredism ruling over? Am I looking at God's word and saying that, okay, Jesus loves me, great, but what I really need to hear about is how I handle this kind of and then move on to the situation. Do we look at praying as a duty? Do we look at reading the Bible as just kind of a responsibility that we have to do? If you can check yes to one or any of those, you may be on the path of losing joy. Second thing he says, has your ability to love others diminished? And and what that is asking is, have we lost a sensitivity to somebody else? Do we look at another person's struggles and concerns that they have in life, and do we think, what a burden, I have to deal with this, not again. Are other people becoming headaches to us and not really a blessing that God intended them to be? When they have success and triumph, are we kind of annoyed with that? And when they have difficulties, are we trying to distance ourselves so we don't want to deal with that? Have we become very critical about others? very complaining the third third test he offers is have you lost a healthy perspective of yourself and what this means is have we lost in our own minds or have we grown in our own minds does everything basically gravitate around what pleases me and what pleases jesus starts to fall by the wayside 
do we start thinking, you know, God, this makes sense to me, and uh, what you say in your word is fine and all, but I'm going to do with what makes sense to me. Do we start looking at the groups that the circles in life, think church, think family, think friendship, work, recreation, does it start to center around us? So it's all about us, and we get so big, we fill in the circles. When that happens, how can we love someone else? God is good. God won't leave us in this kind of empty love-take situation. Instead, the Lord says, consider how far you have fallen, repent, and do what you did at first. You see, God is talking to people that had the faith at one time, and this faith flame burned bright, and this passion was infectious. And he's saying, this needs to come back. How can it come back then? That, that's, that's the question we really want to answer, isn't it? How can it come back? Well, the Lord puts in front of him, first, remember. Remember. Remember what the gospel means to you. Remember to look at Jesus and see the Savior who truly cares. Recall how empty life is, even for a short while, when you start walking away from the things that Jesus says. Remember how empty that is. Remember how pointless it all seems. Remember how good it is when Jesus is there, when you're engaged with Christ and his will. Remember that God found you and God brought you, that God lifted you up to himself. Remember, either in your baptism or through the gospel, he created faith, and he keeps that faith. Remember that wonderful sensation. Every time you read the gospel, every time you relive, really, the Christmas account of the Savior taking human flesh and carrying the weight of the world's sins to the cross, Jesus tasting hell and death, so we wouldn't remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross, when the thief said, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus do? Oh, he remembered. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus also says, remember and then repent. Repent. What it means to repent is simple. It just means change direction. You're on this path and it's no good. Change and go this way. Do the 180, not a 360, 180. Change direction, and this is possible. Your your attitude, it changes. The gospel moves you from loveless to loving, from less than loving to very loving. Let the gospel move you. Let it move you. The Holy Spirit does this. This is the, the work of God. The writer is pointing them back to the gospel, back to the God who is among them, that remembers and cares about them. It's tough when, when, when the fire burns a little less. But this is the way to feel the fire, God's word. Remembering his love, repenting of our sins, knowing that Christ is among us and he works. When we look to Christ on the cross, we never have to wonder. We don't even have to ask, where is the love? We see it there. In his name we pray, amen.